Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of the Enantech Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Cutris, and today joining me, we have a special guest. We have Paul Alcorn from Tom's Hardware, their senior CPU editor. Hi, Paul. Hello, how's it going, Ian? Not too bad. So, Paul and I are currently in San Francisco. This is the week before Computex, the week before everything gets mad. And we were invited to an Intel Data Center Tech Summit today. So, we had the best part of three hours of presentations about Intel's data center strategy surrounding their Optane technology. We also spoke a little bit about 3D NAND, and there just happened to be a little bit of news today coming out of Samsung to do with memory as well. So we're going to cover all these topics. So the big news today was something that we've been waiting for Intel to announce for perhaps the best part of a year and a half, and that is introducing Optane to main memory modules. So currently Intel's application of Optane has been to have Optane SSDs, that's storage based on the Optane technology, and what Intel likes to call Optane memory, which is actually small caching drives to help slower storage be faster in a system by using additional caching. What makes Optane DIMMs special is that it fills the gap in Intel's promises about what this Optane, what this 3D crosspoint technology it can do. Now, in the past, when Intel first introduced this technology, the idea was that Optane fitted in the tier between high-speed storage and super-fast DRAM. Now, the idea was, well, it's going to be faster than storage, but slower than DRAM but it's going to be lower capacity than storage, but it's going to be higher capacity than DRAM. Now, if we consider back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we had two main tiers. We had main memory and we had spinning hard disks. And in the middle of that, we put SSDs. Now, between SSDs and memory, we put NVMe SSDs. Now, what Optane does is that it subdivides that category even further. But you now you have a storage version of Optane and you... We now have the memory version of Optane, and this is what was announced today. Optane DIMMs. Technically, Intel calls it Optane Data Center Persistent Memory. That is too many letters for a title on Anantec or Tom's hardware. <laughs> so we're going to call it Optane DIMMs. Um, or we're going to call it by its code name, which it's been known about for the longest while, which is Apache Pass, which is part of the... Um, what was it? Crystal Lake. Crystal Lake or Crystal Ridge. Uh, Crystal Ridge family. So Crystal Ridge is the overriding family of Optane memory products and Apache Pass is specifically the Optane DIMMs. Um, that, well, I say launch today. It was a disclosure. The full launch is coming later in the year, but this is just to say, hey, we've now got this product ready. We're now sampling it to specific customers. And we also have a development program in place such that if you have a proposal and want to test, you can. Or you can apply and we might give you access to a system, remote access, as long as you sign plenty of NDAs so you can't tell anybody what performance you got. So Optane, 3D Crosspoint, Intel's been promising it for years. This special uh, byte addressable architecture based on Ovonic switches, and um, phase change, Chalco glasses. It's the story of Optane being coming to market has been almost a frustrating one because we've always wanted um, Intel to tell us exactly how it works, and they, they never ha- have. <laughs> they they technically never have. But what we do know is that it's built on a twenty nanometer class process. They have a joint venture agreement and fab with Micron. Um, that is uh, that's what Intel calls its Fab 2, based in Utah. Now, the whole idea of the 50-50 venture is that out of all the 3D crosspoint that comes out, Intel gets half, Micron gets half. And what Can you remember what the Micron products are meant to be called? They were called Quantex, and I've actually seen and analyzed uh, actual working prototypes of that, and we even tracked down the, the company that makes the controller for that for that uh, for those products it's a story it's, it's it's an ssd it's a Correct. cross point ssd that was yeah. their product line it's an ssd essentially yes and it's never came to market we know that they were pretty far along that was about a year and a half ago 
and it just curiously has never arrived and we don't believe that it's on the near term roadmap for from Micron. Yeah, so they've got all this all this 3D cross point coming out of a single factory. Intel's being gung ho about their products. Micron's said almost nothing. Um, there are some suggestions that maybe Micron is selling its cross point to Intel, though we don't have any confirmation of that and nobody wants to talk about any agreement. Um, but Whatever Micron isn't doing with their 3D crosspoint, Intel is, and this is what Optane DIMMs are going to be. So instead of a system that has, say, one terabyte of DRAM, the idea is that you can go down to maybe a quarter of that, go to 256 gigabytes of DRAM, and then add in two terabytes of these Optane DIMMs. So you end up with a larger memory pool, and this extra Optane memory is also persistent. It doesn't need constant refreshing like memory, like a DRAM. So you can then have data structures in place that make everything a lot faster, that stay persistent between boots that's, or between context switches, that have a lot more applicability to you know direct, direct calls, because this stuff is byte addressable direct through the load store units of each core. You're not doing a you're not doing a context switch uh, to to a kernel to read out to an SSD, so you bypass the whole Spectre meltdown issues with context switching. So you get better performance um, with a system that's been shut down but still has all the information in the Octane. You end up booting in. Well, Intel showed a demo that we can't verify that we don't know if it actually represents a realistic, but they showed a 100x startup time. That was going from warm system to warm system. I did notice that. So yeah. they had a system with Optane uh, DIMMs and uh, normal DRAM that booted in 20 seconds yep. versus a DRAM-only system that booted in about 20 minutes. They didn't include the 10 minutes it takes from t actually turning a server on to the BIOS <laughs> finished working. <laughs> I did notice that. So 100x or 2x, you know, that's the, or 3x, that's a sort of... One of the examples of you know how Optane will help, and you know they had a few partners on stage today at the announcement, um, talking about how they're working with Optane. But there are Optane; these Optane DIMMs are built for a future Xeon platform, which has yet to be announced, though we all know it's called Cascade Lake. Correct. Actually, they actually actually they said actually Cascade. did use the Cascade Lake code name today. Yeah. Which was surprising. So. But so it's not... So Optane DIMMs will not work on Skylake Xeon scalable platform-based processors. It is what it is. Um, these modules will be pin compatible with uh, the DDR4 slots. Um, however, Intel would not state if you can mix and match, mix the DDR4 DRAM and the Optane DIMMs in any slot you like. And based on what we've seen with uh, systems that are out in the market using Skylake, you know, systems that have eight DIMM slots for a CPU that has six memory channels, you can clearly see that's you can clearly see now, I guess you can link the two more easily to say, well, six of them are for DRAM and the other two are for Optane. So chances are you're only going to see two Optane slots per socket in this case, though. You know, I, I know you've done you've see, you've posted some stuff yes. that was leaked earlier in the year. Well, it actually wasn't leaked. It, it came from Lenovo, and they politely asked us to remove it afterwards. But they they did give us a, a diagram of one of their servers that is it uses the Perly platform right now, and it is compatible with the Octane DIMMs. And what you can do later, the option is is to drop in a cascade like processor which will actually enable those dim slots right in the future right now they're pretty much useless but there's a lot of special design work that went into accommodating those dims they have a specialized motherboard that has a wider spacing between the dim slots because as we've seen today the optane dims they have a heat spreader and they're much more thicker than your standard dim they also your, your standard server dim server correct. dims don't typically have heat spreaders yeah so in the in the gaming space we yeah, see that yeah. because you got to have your rgb leds and <laughs> yeah. they're not they're not really needed but in the server in the server space when you're using say even 128 gig lr dim 
You don't need a heat spreader. Correct. But for these 3D cross point, for these Optane dims, you do. Correct. And Lenovo was actually water cooling the 3D cross point dims because according to them, they, they pull up to 18 watts maximum. Each. That's each for a 512 gigabyte module. So they're actually liquid cooling those dims in order to deal with the, the heat output from that. And yeah. that is also part of the reasoning behind the wider spacing between yeah. those those dims. Having the dedicated slots. Correct. Um, because a normal uh, a normal DDR4 uh, server module, 16 gig module, is probably you know more of four or five watts, right? Correct. Each rather yeah. not. So you're dealing with you know 3x the power. The the math works out to 32 times the capacity of a 16 gigabyte stick at 3x the power consumption. So yeah, so you're getting 12 12x better efficiency. Absolutely. Which you know. Is, is is a plus, but you still have to deal with the extra power, I guess. So when Intel uh, showed off these Optane DIMMs, they were very clear that these this product will be generating revenue in 2018 for them. When we asked, well, does that mean that their ecosystem partners, their OEMs, you know, the Supermicros, the Dells, what have you, the Lenovo's, will actually be selling systems with them in, in 2018? They said... Quite possibly, but that's up to those those ecosystem partners and their roadmaps, and they're not going to comment on those roadmaps. But they will be selling the modules to the partners in 2018. They did technically announce three different SKUs of uh, Optane DIMMs. We have a 128 gigabyte module, a 256 gigabyte module, and a 512 gigabyte module. It's not going to be like memory where you have to buy a paired kit. I believe it's just going to be you know. That's it. That's your memory. That's how it goes. Um, and they had what they said was a 512 gig DIM and a 256 gigabyte DIM um, on hand that we took photos with. And uh, the press and analysts on hand were trying to find out as much information as possible. We weren't allowed to take off the heat spreader, no matter how no, much I asked. Um, we were we were able to count the uh, the packages on on the memory. Um, I came out with ten. I came out with 11. But you have a good reason. I do have a good reason. So one of the the original 3D crosspoint DIMMs use an FPGA because unlike normal DRAM, you have some, they're going to have to do some type of wear leveling and there's going to be some on-device ECC. You need, you, need like an e, you need like an SSD controller, essentially. Essentially, a much faster and probably streamlined variant. I'm sure that by now they have, they have it down to an ASIC in order to reduce power draw and to make it smaller. Now, I did speak with an Intel representative, and when I mentioned that the previous version had used an FPGA, he said that there are support chips on the die, on the DIMM, but they can't confirm what they are or how many they are, how many there are, because I also noticed that the DIMM has two power capacitors. Now, usually we see that with some type of a power holdup for a DRAM package on any type of enterprise yeah. SSD or something of that nature. So... That's an interesting addition. So when you're counting 11, you're essentially counting 10 packages plus one, one, one you know, co chip. Yeah. yeah. So 10, 10 packages. We were told that this is still first generation 3D cross point. And based on what we know, that would essentially mean that this 512 gigabyte module would have 640 gigabytes of capacity. Correct. Now, when you buy a 32 gigabyte uh, DRAM module, it's got 32 gigabytes, or you know, may, or it's got ECC provisioning, so it may actually have a little bit more. Yeah, you have the extra chip. Yeah, so um, but so having a having a 512 gigabyte Octane DIM with 640 gigabytes capacity means wear leveling, over provisioning. You know, the un, unlike DRAM, these thing, th th this is still a type of storage which can run out. It does have a level of endurance. What level of endurance? Intel wouldn't say. <laughs> yes, and they're going to have to replace failed cells or, or the equivalent of failed cells as they occur with some of that over provisioning. So that you know that implies there has to be some type of abstraction layer there as well. So, but so when we have these three um, D cross point SSDs, you obviously read them right at the block level. So when a block dies, you essentially replace it with a block from what yep. the spare capacity. Correct. Because these are bit addressable, uh, these DIMMs, I, I don't imagine it being at a bit level. 
that blocks will be replaced. I also so, agree, I agree with that. So if you have a block of, say, a few kilobytes, if only one bit out of that fails, you essentially lose all of the, the endurance of all the other bits that even though they may be bit addressable, you still need to it will still need to replace the block. So that arguably reduces the endurance of the obtained DIMs, but because there's such a big over provisioning anyway, you know, it's it, it balances out. We were told that these 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 DIMs would be um, have sufficient endurance for the lifetime of the product, which is a very weaselly way of saying we're not going to tell you yet or, or or ever <laughs> it is it is incredibly blurry because much like ssd's endurance can can change based upon the type of workload you're using or the localized temperature of the environment exactly i agree so yeah uh when we say this is you know like a pre-announcement to a full launch this is the sort of information that we get given we keep asking questions and their response keeps being we haven't disclosed that yet and then my response being, well, I know you haven't disclosed it. That's why I'm asking. Um, but, you know, company disclosures are what they are. So part of these obtained DIMs, the first step, aside from the standard, you know, cloud customers getting hold of them, is that Intel is initiating a, a development program, uh, a program for developers, rather, such that if you make a proposal to through Intel's persistent memory website, they will give you remote access to a system likely under NDA. And that system, as we understand it so far, will be two Xeon scalable processors, Cascade Lake Xeon scalable processors. So how many cores you get is anybody's guess. And what is special about Cascade Lake over Sky Lake is anybody's guess. And if you manage to get into this program, you won't be able to tell anybody anyway. These systems will have 192 gigabytes of DRAM paired with one terabyte of Optane DIMMs. So if that's two Xeon scalable, that means you're running four DIMMs total. So these will be the 256 gig Optane DIMMs in play. Um, that will be paired with you know a, a half terabyte boot drive, a two terabyte NVMe drive, and you know other Optane storage available. Um, a lot, a, one of the features I guess we kind of missed talking about these Optane DIMMs is that they will have hardware encryption so you provide the encryption key at boot time if you want access because obviously the data stays correct, physical attacks would be very yeah. easy with this type of memory you can just pull it out well it's like an SSD, you could just pull it out and stick it in a new system and read correct. so um, the idea is with the hardware encryption it's encrypted when the system is off we mentioned that there's a uh, direct load store from the core, so there's no need for a kernel change. Um, with regard to software, the way that they're approaching Optane DIMMs um, is through development kits. So there is the persistent development kit, the P, uh, persistent memory development kit, PMDK. Um, the idea is that is is fairly open source, and the idea is that they want to sell a concept rather than a lockdown proprietary product when it comes to persistent memory development. And the idea is that developers can work with um, Optane memory either as something that's transparent to software. So they're saying things like the Cassandra stack will enable Optane through its APIs so it's transparent to any developer that uses Cassandra. Right. Or you can actually manipulate it very precisely to get the best performance gain but then you have additional software layers and that becomes a lot more complicated so if you're a big um, independent software vendor a big ISV or a big independent hardware vendor then maybe you go down that route but if you're developing the platform that everybody uses to build software you go down that route if you're the one building software you might not need to if you're using common libraries um, but Intel says that's that's the goal one of the uh, interesting things is that this is going to be the same frequency as DDR4 memory. Correct. It uh, have to be. If, 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 if you've got these sort of paired systems between Optane and DDR, then yes. The only thing is they didn't mention the latency. Now it's obviously going to be lower latency, um, but just stating the frequency kind of almost means nothing. If you have the frequency, it means that the hardware has to keep up with the frequency, but if the latency is a lot longer, then you have a 
wider range of coherency. It's easier to be coherent when you're slow. So the so when we're dealing with cast latencies of seventeen, nineteen in server modules, these octane dims, you know, they could be number out of the hat three hundred. If it's ten, if it it's could ten, be much higher. Absolutely, it yeah. will have to be. If it, if 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 it's if it's ten x lower latency, it's a cast latency of three hundred. Um, you know, if it's a hundred x latency worse, then it's you know keep multiplying until you get to the number that you think it's going to be. And again, Intel didn't mention this. It will be saved for a later date, supposedly. One thing that this topic kind of um, brought up that, uh, you know, I was kind of reading online this and I kind of had a few ideas about it anyway. You remember back to Skylake, Xeon Scalable launch. They, you know, you have your Xeon Bronze, your Silver, your Gold and your Platinum. And each SKU, each CPU could handle, what, 768 gigabytes of That's memory? the standard, unless you yep. have some per money. Correct. But there were special M variants that could support double the memory if you paid an extra $3,000 per CPU. Correct. Now, the to a certain extent, it's arbitrary. It's an arbitrary segregation of your platform. Um, in order to derive more money from those who need more memory. Well, part of the reason why is also because if, if they can store more data for in-memory databases on a single platform, it reduces their licensing costs. So there's a, a big, a big you know, motivator to do that, and it can actually reduce sales of more systems because you're cramming more into that single system. So by kind of locking that behind that paywall, yeah. you're offsetting the loss of those Xeons sales at least to some extent it's yeah and then and then you have competitors that come in <laughs> with a lot more memory yeah it's yeah it, it's the way intel wants to do it but the reason that they gave they said arguably this doesn't ultimately matter because those higher memory skews account for less than five percent of the xeon scalable market and yet now they're coming out with octane dims that say well if you need three terabytes per socket then maybe this is for you <laughs> Right, or maybe maybe even more, depending on how how it's set out. Um, so this is definitely for the players who need high amounts of memory that want more containers per socket, that want you know more microservices that either that either can benefit from just having more memory, or can benefit from having more data in persistent memory, such as you know some of the demos like the rebooting the server type stuff. You know, keep, making sure you have five nines up five nines uptime rather than say three nines uptime which is again an example they gave that we can't confirm but uh we can we can we can only wait until we get it ourselves right yeah um so that's 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 octane dims um that's 3d cross point in memory form i'm glad it's here i'm glad intel are talking about it i wish they went more into the specs absolutely but i wasn't surprised that they didn't so no I'm, I'm glad they even showed us a module, <laughs> to be honest. The um, last time we seen that module was, uh, or at least the first gen one was 2016 storage visions. They actually had one, the first gen prototype there. So yeah. that tells you that's a, that's a three year development cycle. I don't believe that everything went as planned. Well, they, they also technically, didn't they announce it at IDF 2015? It was, I believe it was, yes, pre-announced there, but we seen yeah. the actual working hardware you know, three years prior to, to when they claim general availability in early 2019. Yeah. So that's that's quite a... That's They've been a working cycle. on it. Yes. And they want to recoup their costs as well, no doubt. So one of the additional things that was, that was mentioned uh, at this uh, Data Center Tech Summit today was uh, the next generation of 3D NAND SSDs. If you've been following the coverage on an Antec or Tom's hardware, uh, you on, on this, you'd have seen that um, Micron was it Micron announced what's Correct. called Q, QLC four bits per cell enterprise storage drives. Yes, and they're actually pretty impressive for what they are. Again, this is another case of where we're not being given all of the specs, but we have been told that they will adhere to JDEC endurance uh, regulations, they will spec them according to um, yeah. JDEC, you know, data retention policies uh, without without power for three months, which which is surprising. That's kind of one of the barriers to adding more 
you know, cramming more into bits each, per cell. Yes, more bits per cell. So, well, so so so, as an industry, TLC has been the mainstay now for two, three years. Ha- having by having three bits per cell, you have eight different potential voltage levels per cell. Now, if you have one voltage level in a cell, it's quite easy to read which voltage level you're at. Then going to two bits per cell, you know, you have four different voltage levels. That makes it slightly difficult. Three bits per cell is uh, eight voltage levels, and now we have 16 voltage levels. So the minute you get drift in a cell, it suddenly becomes very difficult to read exactly what, you know, zero, one, zero you're reading. Um, but QLC over TLC is an instant 33% uh, capacity increase. Correct. And 3D NAND is all about capacity these days. Uh, this is the sort of storage where capacity is king. Yeah, you're driving down the you know driving down the cost per bit. You're also increasing the density, uh, having better density in your storage. So Intel, as part of today, said yes. You know, we we're also doing uh, these uh, QLC SSDs based on our 64 layer um, 3D NAND. The way that they're doing it means that you can replace a petabyte of storage from physical hard disks from spinning rust. You you can reduce a whole 42U rack down into 1U of QLC. Correct. It's a, it's pretty impressive, and that's using their, their ruler form factor that Intel has helped push into actually a standardized spec. But... It's the densest possible amount of storage that you right can now, yeah, there, absolutely. Uh, the ruler is um, the best way to describe. It, I think is a super long M.2 drive, but it's not M.2. It's still PCIe based. It is, that but is. but the idea is that the longer you longer you make it, the more chips you can fit on it, and the more capacity you can put on. Yeah, you know. and it's hot swappable, and you know it has a bunch of enterprise grade features. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Intel was saying that these QLC SSDs, um, you know, they're in production. They're, um, client drives, so when they say client drives, is that consumer or enterprise? Consumer, that is. So consumer, consumer drives will be coming to the market in the second half of 2018. Uh, second half in 2018 is July. Is that right? It's like tomorrow, isn't it? No, it's, <laughs> it's pretty it, close. It feels very close, um, though... If they say second half of the year, it's probably mean more like Q4. Yeah. Um, but what they did say is that the presentations that they were running today was on a laptop that had a QLC SSD installed. Um, they wouldn't tell us the capacity of that SSD, but it is what it is. One of the interesting things that came up, which was unexpected um, on Intel's side, is because they had partners there at this presentation saying, how are we using the new Intel technologies? One of them let slip that they were working with 20 terabyte drives already. Two and a half inch drives specifically, yeah. Yeah, so we could, so that almost essentially confirms that, hey, there will be at least up to, there could be higher than 20 terabytes, there could, and there's you know all the different capacities going below as well. Um, QLC SSDs, it's going to be, uh, again, a high capacity play. Now, one of the issues that comes up with when you add more bits per cell is, you know, Cat, does am I going to keep my data? Data retention without well, power. So well, well, no, 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 not without power. The rewrite cycles, right? Oh, yeah, PE cycles. PE cycles. So TLC is uh, three bits per cell is currently rate usually rate about uh, what three to five thousand cycles. It depends on the quality. It depends on the quality, but this is where your uh, ECC really comes into play. And so a lot of the reason why there everyone is now transitioned to LDPC, which is um, you know, low density parity check. This is basically your error correction algorithms when you're dealing with this type of flash is extremely important. So with QLC, that's going to become even more of a factor. So you have to add additional circuitry to ensure that the algorithms are quick and well. Yeah, and you may have to dedicate it, but you know, L- LDPC is an adaptive algorithm. It's it's actually quite complex. Some of the white papers are mind boggling on it. But the error correction will boost it. So if your your raw flash, let's just say for instance, your raw flash for TLC may give you a thousand or two thousand uh, p you know p cycles. But with good ECC or LDPC, which is just a form of ECC, 
you can get him to the three to five k. Yeah, and much. and and so this is going to kind of come out out the gate straight away with QLC. And I remember seeing numbers that uh, from Micron anyway that you know you're going to get a good thousand cycles. Correct. So it's back when QLC was first discussed, it was about write once, read many. Worm. Yeah. It's worm was the acronym. But no, the point is that you're going to have all this capacity, and yet an individual bit you're going to be able to write to less. But because you have more capacity, you're going to actually write to it less often. Correct. So that's you know. That's the trade-off. You write. I mean, if 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 you have double capacity, but you can only write to each bit half as much, then it's. I I, I don't know what the metric would be. Just same efficiency, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But you end up with a higher dent, a, a more dense uh, environment. Yeah, you um, you have more capacity. Yeah, and you know your over provisioning tends to scale linearly with capacity. So the more capacity that you have. You know, yeah. Not only is it not going to be as frequently used, especially in a client environment, you know, just in your desktop PC, you're not going to use it that much. Um, but not only that, you gain more over provisioning as you go. And one of the side benefits of QLC and denser types of NAND is you're driving that cost per di- that bit down. So it's not as expensive to include even more over provisioning. Yeah. So they can really offset that because of the cost. So I don't think endurance would be a problem. When Toshiba first announced it at uh, some flash memory summit a few years ago, and Facebook was asking for QLC SSDs, and Toshiba said they could deliver, I did some back of the mat, you know, back of the napkin. napkin, yes, math on it, and I was, it's pretty clear. It, it was even suitable for yeah. client devices. It's fine. And power consumption would expect it to be fine as well. Yeah, because it's not going to be anything radical. The big thing is is with endurance is rated by data retention after power loss. So with Micron announced QLC SSDs and or for the enterprise enterprise SSDs only have to have a three month rating to retain your data after you remove power when the endurance is exhausted. Yeah, but client drives when when endurance is exhausted. Correct. Client drives require a year. So okay. there's actually a bit of a more stringent requirement there for data retention. Yeah. So, you know, Micron is is leading with enterprise drives, which I would expect. It appears that Intel is leading with consumer drives, which is actually kind of unexpected for me. So. But second half of the year, there's going to be a lot of new Intel and Micron SSD reviews, or at least, you know, on the high capacity. We'll see if they actually sample us those super... High capacity drives. Yes, yes. If they don't sample us, then we'll be forced to buy the small ones that won't be very fast. But. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll argue and butt heads, no doubt. Um, so one of the other interesting stories that came out today, which was kind of unexpected, you know, with speaking with Intel about memory and storage, you know, NAND and DIMMs, and then Samsung decides to come and announce so DIMMs with thirty-two gigabyte capacity using new sixteen gigabyte. I sees. Um, what makes it special is that these are, you know, so dims that are unbuffered. These are UDIMs, so you put them in client systems. Now we don't have 32 gigabyte DDR4 UDIMs yet, so the fact that these are on mobile memory modules to begin with makes no sense. Because when we went from eight gigabyte modules to 16 gigabyte modules, they all came out on desktop first. When we went from DDR3 to DDR4, the high capacity DDR4 was all 16 gigabyte modules. Yeah, great. Let's all stick them in our system if you can afford it because the DRAM price market is crazy. But these are 32 gigabyte SODIMs. So if you have space for two modules in your laptop, you can now have 64 gigabytes of memory. Now, so these don't have ECC, so they're not for the Z- not for the Xeons and they're not for the enterprise and the fact that the high capacity means that they're for prosumer which probably means you know they're going to be stuck in some high-end dell precision 17 inches type thing samsung's marketing for this d for this dram is entirely focused on gaming that's their statement is it's they will deliver gaming experiences on laptops more powerful and immersive than ever before so yes premium so, so premium product desktop replacement systems i think yeah the, when you're already spending two to three thousand on a on a notebook that you know offers 
two two and a half minutes of battery life to begin with. Well, and, and these are also ten nanometer class DRAM, so there's going to be some power savings there, and I think that's kind of the angle they're taking there. And I believe you're right; they can they can charge a premium there. Well, so well we, we were kind of speaking about this earlier. So because the market for so dims is smaller, but the sort of items that they the sort of products that they go into tend to be tend to be more premium, right? So if Samsung are having say yield issues and they wanted a higher um, higher average selling price, then they would stick them in sodiums. If they wanted to actually bulk sell them to everybody, they'd be in you know standard dims for desktops, but they're not. When will they come? Time will tell. What platforms will support them? Your guess is as good as mine. Probably, I, I would suggest that because AMD rates Threadripper at two terabytes per socket, new dims, they'll probably work there with a the BIOS update. That would uh, be pretty sweet, actually. Intel gets pretty strict on its memory support, and while they define memory support at a high level as total system memory, in reality, it's actually a per per um, memory socket limitation. So even though a CPU says we support sixty four gigabytes of memory. That's usually split between four, split between two channels and then two DIMMs per channel, so four DIMMs total, so 16 gigabyte DIMMs. So whether Intel specified those chips as 64 gigabytes to begin with to stop speculation, which is perfectly possible, we'll see a massive update to Intel's processor database. <laughs> Everything suddenly has double capacity, which, you know, it answers that question anyway. So... We, we suspect these modules to initially be available only through specific customers, not in retail. They'll be in the OEM systems. They'll be in the high-end, you know, Dells, Alienwares, what have you. If they're aiming for gaming, you know, HP, Omen, Predator, or, you know, Acer Predator, that sort of stuff. That's where you'll see it first. Whether you actually know that you have Samsung 32 gigabyte DIMMs is whether you're that much of an enthusiast that you care what memories in your system. Uh, we still need to reach out properly and ask, you know, who are your major partners? Who are you, What's your ecosystem? Um, are these uh, coming to retail? How much are they going to cost? You want that much? Okay, here's my firstborn. <laughs> the memory market's crazy pricing right now. Um, so what, it's it's going beyond $10 a gigabyte or something stupid now. So if these are 32 gigabyte SODIMs, you're looking at $300 plus per module. Easily. Yeah. It's going to be pretty expensive. Uh, someone else can buy it for me, maybe. <laughs> yes. So that's pretty much it for our um, memory and storage uh, podcast today. Uh, it was it's it's a whirlwind. Uh, both Paul and I are off to Computex next week, um, where you'll sit here on both an Antec and Tom's hardware a lot of Computex coverage, a lot of you know generational updates on a lot of PC products, and we have a lot of meetings, and our schedules are full, so. Stop asking for more meetings, please. Though we'll take a briefing if you have one. Um, so stay tuned to both websites to see more coverage. Let us know what you think. Um, we both have Twitters. <laughs> We're both active on Twitter enough to respond to most messages. Um, but thank you, Paul, for thank joining you, us on the yeah. podcast. Thank you. I think there's a request that we do some during Computex as well. So as long as you're not too tired, um, we'll do some I'm of those. Excellent. So thank you, thank you everybody for listening, and we'll catch you next time.